Martin, and I'm a Chicago-based audio description writer and voicer. So, in general, what we're going to go through tonight is kind of a definition of audio description. We're going to look at where uh, that's applied, some of the rules for audio description. You'll actually get uh, a fairly in-depth uh, uh, overview of what audio description really is and, and some of the rules of audio description and how that is applied to media and live performance. And then I have about, uh, I have three or four videos, uh, that a couple of commercials, and then a, a snippet of a film that I did that uh, will show audio description in action. And uh, I have a list of resources at the end, and then you can take any questions you have after that. Cool. So, what is audio description? Well, as I talked about, or gave Dennis uh, in the run-up to this meetup, audio description makes visual images accessible for people who are blind or have low vision. Using words that are succinct, visit, vivid, and imaginative, description translates the visual image into an oral form that is accessible to these individuals. So in the performing arts and media, description inserts this narrative into the natural pauses in the dialogue or between critical sound events. So, that's easy enough, but I'd like to take a little time to delve a little bit more deeply into what that really means. Easy enough, it's another way to think about it, is, is to say what you see. We are doing a translation from the visual to the oral. Now, typically, you think of a translation as, oh, say, going from French to English or the other way around. Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I'll follow my slides here. So, there are many different names for audio description. Audio description is used a lot in the US. Uh, they use this logo to identify audio description. So, it's a square box with a capital block letter A and D, and to the right of the D are three sound waves emanating from the curve of the D. So, that is the symbol for audio description in the United States. In Canada, they use described video, and that is just a block letter D with two sound waves emanating from the right-hand side of the curve of the D. Some people also call it video description, but when you abbreviate that to block letters, it's rather <laughs> unfortunate uh, element. So we don't call it video description. The people who use audio description are obviously people who are blind or have low vision. So who are they? Who is this population? Well, according to a report from the 2012 National Health Interview Survey, 20.6 American adult, million American adults age 18 or older reported experiencing vision loss. So here, the term vision loss refers to individuals who reported that they had trouble seeing, even when wearing glasses or contact lenses, as well as to individuals who reported that they are blind or unable to see at all. This estimate pertains to a nationally representative sample of non-institutionalized civilian population 18 years of age or older. Of that population, 12.4 million are women and 8.2 million are men. 15.3 million are between the ages of 18 and 64, and 5.3 million are 65 years of age or older. And of the 20.1 million people who indicated race on the, who indicated one race on that survey, 16.6 .6 million are white, 2.6 million are black or African American, 2.9 million are Hispanic or Latino, and 668,000 are Asian, and 236,000 are American Indian or Alaska Native. As far as education level is concerned, of the Americans who have vision loss and are 25 years of age or over, 4 million have less than a high school diploma. 5.1 million have a high school diploma or a GED, 5.8 million have some college education, and 4.1 million have a bachelor's degree or higher. So this is not a homogeneous population. Vision afflictions, whether it's complete blindness or we have retinal uh, neuropathy or tunnel vision, all of these things would, all this would be rolled into this population. So why do we do this? Well, the desire in audio description is to make the blind and low vision experience as comparable to the sighted experience as possible. So we get into issues of accessibility, get into issues of independence, 
if I go to a museum and I'm, bl have, I'm blind or I have low vision, I'd like to be able to walk around that museum by myself, not necessarily have to have a companion with me. Content equity. I should be able to get as much out of the content that's there as the sighted individual. And overall quality of life, because people who are blind or have low vision, they tend not to go out as much, they don't participate in social gatherings as much as some other folks, and it's just a real hassle. So, now I've caught up with myself. Translation. So we typically think of translation, again, as being across a single sense. So, for instance, when I'm translating something from French into English, if I'm doing a written version, I write from French, and I write the English equivalent. I can also translate speech in the oral realm from French into English. So that can be modified, it can be codified, and it can be a word-for-word -word direct translation. In audio description, translation is across the senses. We're translating the visual into the oral. There's no equivalent of a correct or a certifiable piece of audio description. All right, so you can see that it's more nuanced because it relies on language to step in, and there's no way to define the best sentence to be written or the best way to say things. But just as language has rules about things like word order and structure, in audio description, those rules are known as standards or best practices, which are a little bit stronger than just recommended guidelines. But for the technically-minded minded folks like myself, there's got to be some way to do better than just, you know, recommended guidelines, right? Well, if you delve into AD a little bit more, it can be applied to what some, uh, and to see what some of the challenges are in each situation. This title brought up live performance in media. In the context of audio description, I would put it that audio description and for live performance in media differs solely in the time or temporal domain. So in live performance, things are changing. Characters are moving. The order of what is being said can change from one night to the next, from one performance to the next. Whereas in media, I know exactly where all of those gaps are going to be. It's a fixed piece of, of, of content. And so that makes it a little bit easier. So it's much easier for me to write a script for a piece of media, knowing how long I have to say and to plan better and deliver it in that way. So let's look at some of the performance use cases. So for live performance, the stuff that moves, there's obviously theater. Now this can be plays, it can be poetry slams. It can be musical acts. It can be an opera. These are all come out of that heading of theater. I can describe dance, but I have to use a different vocabulary. I'm going to describe tap versus ballet versus modern dance. Corporate functions, meetings, uh, social gatherings, dinner parties, galas. There are conferences, which can be academic conferences, trade shows. Imagine you're walking around a, the, the exhibit floor of a conference. Where are, the where are the vendor booths? How do I get from one place to the next? Where are the bathrooms? Where are the meeting rooms themselves? So lectures and webinars. If I'm, I can listen to a TED talk, but if I'm, or a lecture by an academic professor, but if I can't see the material that they're presenting visually, how I'm only getting half, if not less, of the information that they're describing. Architectural tours. Now this is kind of a hybrid in that if I'm taking a Chicago boat tour, the buildings aren't moving, but my path along the river may change and the speed at which I go through them changes. I just did a couple of animal shows at the Brookfield Zoo this last Sunday as part of the ADA 25 event. I described a dolphin show, and I described a, a pre-flight bird show. Uh, if you weren't able to see it, well, you're missing kind of what they're doing. Are they doing a backward tail walk? Are they doing a forward tail walk? What's that bird that just whizzed by my head? Is that a red-tailed hawk? What does that look like? So all of these things are lost 
if I can't get that information. So remember, the purpose of audio description is to provide the same or as equivalent as possible uh, that experience to the blind and low vision population as the sighted audience gets. So in media, we have obviously television shows. If I'm watching a television show, then maybe many times when I can't see what any of the characters are doing. Now oftentimes in the past, people who are blind or have low vision, their family members or friends would sit next to them and describe what's going on to the best of their ability. But I don't have to rely on that if I've got audio description in the television show itself. Same thing for movies. If I go to a theater, um, one of the first movies I saw that had audio description was, uh, oh, I'm blanking on it. It was the, uh, about the tiger in the boat on the ocean. Oh. Life, of life of Pi. Life of Pi. Life of Pi. There are long stretches in the life of Pi where there's no dialogue. He's just hanging out at sea. There are times when he looks over the edge of the boat and he sees the myriad of, of life underneath him, all different colors and shapes swimming by. But that can go on for long stretches of time. And there's nothing orally in the soundtrack of the film to, to tell you what's going on. So that would really make that experience a whole lot less inclusive. There's a listserv as part of the American Council of the Blind uh, audio description project that uh, recently there was quite a bit of chatter on that website about Netflix movies. So there was a, there's a, uh, a Marvel superhero named Daredevil. Daredevil was blind, but the series itself initially was not audio described. So there's <laughs> an activist here in Chicago named Robert Kinnett, he's blind, and he has started up the Netflix Accessibility Project and has lobbied them to get description for their Netflix produced content. He succeeded in that, and so more and more uh, shows on Netflix and across the, the realm of television and movies are being described. I'll talk a little bit later about the Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2010, but essentially there is some legislation that's come online uh, just in the last few years that uh, mandates how much of the broadcaster's programming needs to be audio described. Cultural institutions. Imagine going to the Art Institute and trying to experience that as a person who was blind or low vision. What does that painting look like? How do I move around the space? Same thing with natural history museums. Sue, the, the, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, what does that look like? What do some of the other dinosaurs look like? Without audio description, I have no idea. Science museums, botanical gardens. If I go up to, to Lavinia and I walk through the botanical gardens there, those exhibits change. The colors are vivid. The sensory overload is, is wonderful. But if I can't see it, I'm missing quite a bit of what's going on. A big part of audio description these days, as far as where this work is coming from, are national park sites. So the National Park Service has a mandate to describe and make accessible all of their park sites. So I just did a an audio tour of the Cape Hatteras National Seashore. It's 80 miles long across three islands. There are 80 different stops across, uh, across that tour. But if I, now obviously I can't get to those stops simply by myself if I would have, was blind and only had low vision. But once I get to those stops, I want to find out what's there. Can I take a ramp down to the beach? What do the dunes look like? What do the panels on, on the side, on the wayside say? And so they're doing this in, not only for these external sites, but they are doing this for uh, just regular visitor center museums. I've done about 15 or 20 uh, national park sites, anywhere from Carlsbad Caverns to Fort Smith, Arkansas, to the FDR Library in Hyde Park. So this is a, a really ripe site for, for work in audio description, but the mandate is there from the National Park Service. Local park sites, uh, more and more folks are, are trying to make their, their institutions accessible. Uh, I know Naperville has just put out an RFP for some of their kiosks at the, in, the, 
their nature center. And so these are some of the places where that can happen. If you go to Millennium Park right now, uh, the ADA 25 Chicago group, which is sponsored by the Chicago Community Trust, has put a series of panels along one of the walkways in Millennium Park that talk about the construction of the park and some of the, the, the uh, structures there. And they have put up a series of panels that, that give that information. So if I am blind in low vision, I can take my smartphone out and scan the QR code that takes me to a website that will audio describe the panels and the park itself. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of people have friends or family who essentially function as a personal describer for folks and will take them around and tell them what's going on. But this is also something that would be interesting for a lot of these areas, whether it's a cultural institution or a corporate meeting or a gala. Uh, last year, uh, I'll back up one step. Every year, the Kennedy Center uh, sponsors a conference called Leadership Exchange in Arts and Disabilities. They have the conference every year, one year in Washington, and then the, the off year in some other U.S. city. Last summer, that conference was here in Chicago. And there was a gentleman who was blind from the Irish Theater that I was his personal describer for those four days of the conference. So I would take him around to the conference rooms. I would tell him what the food is in front of him on the buffet. I would navigate the space for him and describe any of the slides and materials that were presented at that conference. So that personal description is that means that he could more fully enjoy and get the content, that content equity, that quality of experience in that particular situation. All right, so let's get a little bit more into what audio description really is. So this is kind of a quick crash course for y'all in, in what audio description is. The first rule is describe what you see. One sees physical appearances and actions. One does not see motivations or intentions. So we see that Mary clenches her fists. We do not see that Mary is angry, or worse, that Mary is angry at John. You can't describe that. You include the visual information that is inaccessible to people who are blind or have low vision. These include key plot elements, such as people, places, actions, objects, or unknown sound sources, not mentioned in the dialogue or made obvious by what one hears. Now, describing everything is impossible. You describe first what is essential in the allowable time. So, and then as time permits, you describe further elements, such as the decor of details of the settings, the physical appearance and mannerisms of the characters, their architecture, clothing style, the technology, color, light, texture, all those things, if you have time, you can say it. But description should not fill every pause. Less is more. Description is not a running commentary. Listeners should be allowed to hear the emotions in actors' voices and the tension of the silence between the characters. Now, when you're in a play or even media, it's important to describe seemingly insignificant things that the sighted audience will observe without knowing their later importance. So, for example, you would describe that Mary is toying with a pistol and then places it in the top desk drawer. So later in the show, when John and Mary are having a heated argument and Mary edges toward the desk, the sighted audience will suspect she's headed for the gun. But because you've given that inf information about what she has been doing with the pistol and where she's placed it, by describing both of those actions, you've allowed the listeners to join in that suspenseful anticipation. The second rule of audio description is to describe objectively. Allow listeners to form their own opinions and draw their own conclusions. You don't editorialize, interpret, explain, analyze, or help listeners in any other way. So for instance, if the conclusion is that a character is angry, we describe what led to that conclusion. Gestures, facial expressions of the character. The character's moods, motives, or reasoning are not visible and thus not the subject of the description. We only use those adjectives and adverbs that do not offer value judgments and that are not themselves subject to interpretation. So for instance, beautiful says only that something is not ugly. But what exactly makes it beautiful? Instead of saying the person, clothing, or object is beautiful, to 
describe the things that observe that cause your conclusion so that listeners can draw their own conclusion. We also use the first person when the director of a show or a play has created a first person point of view as a means of including the audience. This sensation is part of the experience of sighted audience members, and it must be shared with listeners. So when a character turns to address the audience, you say, she turns to us, instead of, she turns to the audience. You're not breaking that fourth wall. His flashlight shines in our eyes. With film and video description, the same would apply. The shark swims toward us, not, the shark swims toward the camera, or, we move through the forest instead of the camera moves through the forest, giving them that same experience. Next, you want to be sure to allow the listeners to hear the dialogue. Listeners want to hear the performance first and the description second. The dialogue is telling the story and must be heard. Now, this rule is only broken when the confusion by omitting the description is greater than maintaining the integrity. So as an example, Deborah is talking non-stop about making a pie, but she is quietly taking a gun from a drawer. The describer must speak over her dialogue because the audience will hear a gunshot before she stops talking about making the pie. The sounds or the dialogue from a radio, television, or other speaking characters may be important to the story or may be considered background sound. But if it is background noise, permissible to describe over it, assuming the description is vital. However, you don't want to talk over a song played on the radio if its recognition by the audience or the audience's hearing its content may be important in setting a mood, recalling an era, or making an emotional statement. We often use short phrases in place of full sentences. We try to speak at least two or three words so listeners have the opportunity to switch focus to the describer's voice. But, and unless absolutely necessary, we try not to interrupt with just one word. It's all about the timing. When you have plenty of time, you can say things like, Ken walks across the room, picks up a knife, and butters the toast. When time is tighter, Ken picks up a knife and butters the toast. When it's extremely tight, Ken picks up a knife and butters toast. Next, you have to trust the listener's ability to comprehend the material. In most instances, listeners have made the choice to attend the performance or watch the show, so you have to trust them to grasp the meaning of the material and the description. Don't condescend, patronize, or talk down to the listeners. For example, when I describe costumes in a play where women wear bustles, I can confirm that everyone knows what a bustle is by tucking the description into a set of pre-show notes with something like, of women's long skirts puff out and back, padded over the hips and under the skirts, with bustles. Then, all you have to do is say the word bustle thereafter while the play is happening to convey the costume during the performance. If a play has a complex plot or a confusing set of characters, there's probably information you can share from the playbill. Just as this information is helpful to sighted audience members, sharing this information with listeners during a set of pre-show notes may aid their appreciation description. This can also happen in the form of reading from the playbill, but it's important to make clear that the information comes from the program so that listeners understand that everyone has access to this information, that I'm not providing them special information because they may have trouble following the material or may assume that that's happening. I don't want to do that. Now, for many diverse reasons, some people prefer a minimal description as opposed to longer descriptions as the time allows. People who are congenitally blind or born without sight are often com comfortable with the level of information they glean from what they routinely hear and sometimes don't realize how much visual information is available. On the other hand, people who are adventitiously blind or born with sight but lost it later know that there's a great amount of visual information and don't want to miss it. But it's the describer's responsibility to find that Next, censorship is unfair to the material and to the listeners. Describers use sensory information because of their own discomfort fail their listeners. Describers must say the factual information, such as things as nudity, sexual acts, and violence. 
listeners should know everything that is evident to sighted people. If a describer feels that describing particular material will make him or her feel uncomfortable, he or she should not accept the assignment. Keep the language consistent. The describer needs to choose language that is consistent with the content of the material. You need to use language that is appropriate for the listeners. For instance, children's programs should use vocabulary suitable for the age group. And remember that they may not have the life experience to know common expressions like catch 22. You need to make every effort to pronounce words properly. Actors' names, directors, designers' names, characters' names, the names of objects and places. And once you have established the name for the characters and places and such, always use that same name. You have to know that not all listeners will understand slang, colloquialisms, and regional terms. Only use those, again, within the context of the performance. And as I said at the beginning in the definition of audio description, you only use vivid verbs or descriptive words. People frequently walk, but they also amble, stagger, Shuffle, saunter, stroll, all conveying different amounts of emotion, all different physical characteristics. You need to choose the words that best matches that action. Time shifts are another time when it becomes difficult, like flashbacks or vision of the future. And in relation to the character, music and visual effects may further identify these time changes. So for example, I could say, Lighting shifts to pale amber as George is next to his sister in the family dinner table. That change of lighting cues the listener in to what is going on on stage. Now, people often say to me, well, why do I describe colors for people who are blind or have low vision? Well, describing colors is useful both to help people with low vision to locate what's being described, because again, it's not a homogeneous community but also to spend and share the emotional meaning of the color of the production. People who are blind or who have low vision usually share those common attributes we assign to color, such as blue and green being cool and serene, while red and orange are hot and tempestuous. Saying, the dress is burgundy, rather than, the dress is red, more richly describes the dress. However, you want to avoid unusual color words like cyan or juice. A corollary to the rule about language consistency convert, uh, concerning vocal tone. The describer should match their vocal delivery to the pace, energy, and volume of the material. You want to allow the performance to set the tone and rhythm of the description, remembering that the performance, not the describer, should be the focus. So just as a describer should not assume a detached, lecturing, or clinical tone, the describer should attempt to project him or herself into the performance as another, they should not attempt to project him or herself in the performance as another performer. Dramatizing the delivery of the description is distracting and perhaps insulting because the listener may feel as if the describer is telling them how to respond. Sighted audience members don't see the character's race, ethnicity, or nationality. Rather, they see skin color and facial features. Therefore, a describer should simply describe each person's skin color and, if time allows, facial features. In a dramatic work where characters' backgrounds develop over time, the writer, director, and actors will help the audience learn where each character fits into the world of the play or show. Socioeconomic level, educational level, relationship to other characters. So to the extent that some or all of these are important to the storyteller. In a dramatic work, or perhaps because of the story and the setting, the character's race, ethnicity, or nationality is largely apparent to sighted visitors, audience members, and integral to the plot, delineating those differences as part of the description would be helpful. For example, in West Side Story, the plot is much more understandable if one knows who's a jet and who's a shark, and that the jets are Caucasian and the sharks are Puerto Rican. In A Raisin in the Sun, there should be no story there would be no story without knowing that the primary focus is an African-American family and that the antagonist, Carl Hintner, is Caucasian. And finally, you want to describe from the listener's perspective. 
Surprises should, ideally, come at the same time for all audience members. If a character's appearance or actions, hidden identities, costumes, sight gags, or sound effects happen as a surprise to the sighted audience members, don't spoil the surprise of the listeners by describing or revealing them in advance. If a character is in disguise, he becomes the man rather than John wearing the disguise. Jim is all about. Now I need to get out of this and put in PowerPoint to show some comments. So on my website, which I'll give you at the end, there are a number of videos at the bottom of my AD page that I've described. So this one is an old joke. Now, a beer commercial. Flying low over the ocean on a foggy night, churning in spring water. Words, Film Academy, Bottom Bertin Bear presents BOATS, based on a true story, an advancing aircraft carrier in front of A blue sweep across a radar screen. A radio operator, crewmen at computer consoles. Captain, there's an island object at 1200. Sir, contact established. On speaker, please. Two men eating at a table. This is AA53. Please change your course by 15 degrees southwards in order to prevent a collision with us. This is the USS Lincoln, member of the United States Navy. Change your course by 15 degrees northwards in order to avert a collision with us. Over. This is not possible. You have to avoid. Tight lipped and gray with leathery skin, the captain takes the radio mic from its dock. This is Captain Richard James Howard speaking, commander of the USS Lincoln aircraft carrier, part of the Navy of the United States of America. The men by their radio. We are the second largest warship of the American fleet. We are escorted by two cruisers, six destroyers, and four submarines. I command you to change your course by 50 degrees northwards. If you do not comply, we will be forced to take necessary action. Over. The captain's hard face smirking. The men return to their food, glancing at one another. The crew motionless, eyes fixed in their illuminated faces. This is Manuel Salazar Caldera. We are two persons. With us, we have our dog. We have our food and a friend who is making a siesta right now. We do not move anywhere. We are a lighthouse, and the coast of is Spain. The lighthouse beam sweeps over a rocky coastline, forming in the clouds over the ships, works with a beer bottle. Always right. Shut down the Wi Fi, did they? Nope. Think so. I'll try another one and we'll see what happens. Sure. Chinese. In English, pet shop. A white skull with headphones and two baby ostrich. Porcelain cats. One waving its arm. A bulldog sleeping on the floor. An old Chinese man with a white beard cleaning a shih tzu. Cups that's falling to the floor. A young man by a tropical fish tank pulls a pack of gum from his jeans, tries it, and eats a stick as an orange fish. Begins to sing with others in the tank. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, scaramouche, will you do the bandango? Send the phone to lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo. He glances at the gum cat. All the cats sing along. Bright yellow fish, a bearded dragon, the cat, a canary. Oh, mamma mia, mamma mia. 
Fact that we got to hear it. You got to hear it without the video. Right. Without, without the, the images. description. <clears throat> well, you, without the visuals. So we'll try this. Chinese again. character. In English, pet shop. A white skull with headphones and two baby ostrich. Porcelain cats. One waving its arm. A bulldog sleeping on the floor. An old Chinese man with a white beard cleaning a shih tzu. Cuffs is falling to the floor. A young man by a tropical fish tank pulls a pack of gum from his jeans. Tries it and eats a stick as an orange fish. Begins to sing with others in the tank. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the pandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, he glances at the gum pack. All the pets sing along. Bright yellow fish, a bearded dragon, a cat, a canary. A swan fish, a skull, of baby birds. Nodding his head to the beat, the young man surveys the animal world, smiles, and thrusts his arm in the air. The old man looks up. The fish swim away. The young man smiles. Woohoo! Refresh! Try it fresh. So it's interesting in that, in a couple instances, I had to say things a little bit before, sometimes a little bit after. So the temporal description that I could give did not exactly match the, the, the visual information, but it conveyed the story nonetheless. So you have to be very judicious about where those kinds of things happen. And I have one more piece here uh, that is more of an educational video. A long, pale, slender-bodied shark walks across the sea floor rather than swim by wriggling its body and pushing with its pectoral and pelvic fins. Its features include a general brown coloration with numerous clusters of mainly two to three dark polygonal spots, widely scattered white spots in the matrix between dark clusters, fewer than ten large dark spots on the interorbital snout region, and a pair of large dark marks on the ventral surface of the head. Clamoring over the rough terrain of the sea floor, similar to a baby crawling on its stomach, the shark forages for food by sticking its snout into the corners, recesses, and alcoves of rock and coral formations for any prey which may be hiding therein. Bamboo sharks, or long-tailed carpet sharks, belong to the family Hemicelidae in the shark order Erectologiform. So, this, so these have different purposes. Obviously, this one would be, for instance, for our high school zoology uh, educational video, where you're getting information about not only what the shark looks like, but its behaviors, and some additional uh, information about the uh, genus and scientific names of the shark. So it all depends, again, on your audience, what it is you're trying to convey, whether it's entertainment, whether it's educational, whether it's high school, whether it's general population. Uh, so those are some, some ideas uh, as far as the, the context of what it is you're trying to do. I have one more video here. Let's see if I can quit out of Safari. And I'm going to first play a video, a few minutes of a video that I did that does not have description, or did not have description. So I'm going to First, hear the version without description. I'll play you know, a minute or two of that, and then I'll go back and play the described version. So this is the, the movie as I received it.
We share our lives with people. We think we know them. But do we ever really know anyone? So this is now the described version of that. It's about 10 minutes long. Captions, a Shavik Insight Studios production in association with Regent Entertainment. On an overcast day, a man in black athletic pants, white running shoes, and a white t-shirt crashes through dense forest underground. He looks back over his shoulder at another man, tromping after him, wearing a long black hood and leg, black clothes and black lizard boots. Big fog swirls through the trees. The running trips over a fallen wall lie in space frozen in the soggy forest floor, thick with leaves, and then it swallows to the ground. The runner rolls onto his back, panting as a hooded man approaches through the fog and starts to move. The fallen man starts to speak as a hooded man steps on his chest. The necklace lies in the leaves of the sun. The light fades to black. A sunny, cloudless day outside a green, two-story house with a two-car garage, tree-lined driveway, white picket fence, and a landscape front yard. Captions, Eugene Ward. Now inside the house, a study with numerous paintings on the walls, another partially draped on an easel. We share our lives with people. We think we know them. But do we ever really know anyone? A masked nude, a man's face behind the shroud, a woman standing by a man cutting his tie with the scissors, a doll lying on his back. On a table, a wooden metronome sits next to several framed photographs of a man and woman. In front of the Eiffel Tower, dancing, looking into each other's eyes, additional canvases sit stacked to the side on a window-lined court where a cat grooms herself while sitting on an end table. A ponytail, dark-haired woman in a floppy white sun hat kneels on the ground outside in a backyard next to a flower bed and a multi-tiered clover. A line of tall evergreens stand guard along a wooden fence at the back. In the garden, yellow daffodils bloom next to pink peonies. The woman digs in the dirt wearing pink garden gloves with white flowers. She clips a bunch of daffodils, laying them carefully in a woven wicker basket. She glances toward the house, stands, and picks up her basket. Carrying the basket, she walks into the house. She lays her hat on a chair by the front door, pulls aside the lace curtains to see the person knocking, then opens the door. Please, let me take a minute. She sighs, then shrugs. Well, I want to 
almost just about to make some coffee. Mr. McCoy steps into the study. He wears a gray suit, white shirt, gray striped tie, and carries a black briefcase. Did you pay all these? Yes, I did. After Leonard died, I never got a finishing that one. I have a whole storage room downtown. Careful, it's fine. Thank you. She hands him a letter. You think of selling? Uh, I have a strong hand, confident sense of color. You're a teacher, right? Yeah. I'm a professor of art history at University of Oregon. They both sit. So, what's all this about? Well, I work for Bremer Insurance, so insure Arthur White, who your husband used to work. Uh-huh. You know how I think after all these years of this would stop? Do you know how long it took to pay off this funeral expenses? Not a rich woman. I was accusing you of anything. No. Her face hardens. So what are you doing here? You came all the way here to engage a lonely widow with some casual chit-chat. This is Tom, sir. You know. She rises. I have so much work to do, so if you don't have anything to tell me that I haven't already heard, I would like you to leave now, please. He stands. You believe your husband died a week ago. Her brow furrows. That's impossible. My husband died. Three days ago, my company received an anonymous tip that uh, Leonard Thompson, your husband, was living in Washington under the name of Bill Robbins. She stares at the photograph, turning away from Mr. McCoy. She blinks and shakes her head. She drops the photo on the coffee table, straightens herself. I'm sorry. I don't believe this. She heads toward the door. McCoy gathers his case and follows her. I know this is painful. I really do need your help. Look, I don't want, I can't, I can't do this. If you change your mind. You just don't take no for an answer, do you? Here's my card. It's got my cell number on it. Call me anytime. Just take it. Thanks for the coffee. He walks out the door. Mrs. Thompson closes the door and stares down at McCoy's card in her hand. Later that night, an interior door bangs gently in the wind next to a glass vase filled with diamonds. In Canada, Mrs. Thompson sits on a couch in her pajamas, hair down. A jazz record plays on the turntable. She leaps through an old scrapbook filled with pictures and mementos of her husband. She turns the page to a picture of Leonard. Her fingers trail across the page. On the facing page, a newspaper clipping reads, Office building burns, man dies. She wipes away something in her eye. She turns the page. Another headline reads, Widow cleared of charges, money still missing. She stops, twisting around to see the door has knocked over the flowers. She steps over to the mess and moves to get a call.
stepping carefully around the broken glass. She kneels down, picks up the flowers from the floor, placing them gently in the cloth. Walking past Leonard's half draped portrait, clutching the flowers and cloth in her arms, she stops short. She stares at the painting, breathing deeply, then turns her head and walks away. Actually, it looks like you got one. I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. A lot of questions. Um, so you, you had yeah. some value judgments to, to make. You, you, we hear the door close, but you mm -hmm. chose to say that's the door closing. Is there, are there times when you think, well, maybe I don't have to say that? Or, yes. Okay. It, it also sounds like there are times where you're recording at one pace, but you're speeding up using Pro Tools or something? Not at all. You're, okay. That's all on my vocal. Hey, just, right. just to ask is that you repeat the question. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Sure. Yeah, okay. So there was one question about the the choice of when to uh, mention that the door was opening or closing. That was a, a choice on my part as the instructor. And then as far as the pacing of, of my voice, I did not use any, any pro tools or any other uh, effects to, to speed it up and slow it down. Yes, Mark. Do you, uh, <clears throat> do you user test this stuff before you release it to the public? Like, is it... Test it on, a, on an audience, and then they say, well, we're not really getting this part of it, or? Generally, that does not happen. Uh, it does happen when I do national park sites, so when I've written the script before it's recorded for a presentation for a user to carry around. They can read everything that I've written, and that they have the opportunity to uh, comment on whether this is not clear, or I missed that part, or those kinds of things. So in that sense, those things do get tested. And, Obviously, the description becomes that much more better if you have audience participation. Now, that also though, can bring up some additional uh, variances in people's appreciation or expectation about what description is. Since there's no certification for describers, uh, there are trainings. I was trained by the American Council of the Blind and also at the Kennedy Peak Conference. They had a, a, a workshop that I, I participated in. Uh, People's delivery and choices are their own delivery and choices. So one describer is not going to describe it the same way as another, and there's no way to say there's one true way to make it happen. Okay. The other thing I want to ask is uh, clearly this kind of work that you're doing in terms of film and commercials is scripted, yes. but you also do live work. I do. What do you find more challenging or, you know what I'm getting at? Like what is your favorite type of work to do? Right, so the question is, there's a description for video where it's scripted uh, in the television shows, and there's also a live description, which do I personally find more appealing. Or challenging. Or challenging. Or so what? it's definitely challenging to do things live um, without, so if I'm, but if, so for instance, there are many different live situations. Uh, the, the situation where I was a personal describer for the person at the lead conference, I would just say things to him as I walked along or as we sat there. And so there was, and I didn't have to worry so much about stepping on people's dialogue or, or a story being told as a presenter in that situation. He was presenting slides and they would pause. I'd describe what was in the slides and so on and so forth. Um, doing a show live, like a dolphin show or bird show, there's a narrator talking as well as the actions of the birds. And so I have a script excuse me, I have the script laid out in front of you, the kinds of things I can say, but it's really, you know, I'm just trying to find uh, that, that, that place that I can say it. Now, invariably, you step on people's lines in that situation. Uh, if I'm doing a play, I also script the, the play, and I see it two or three times, and I often work with a video of the play before I do the actual performance. So in that case, I get a really good sense of where those, those uh, pauses are, but from one night to the next, the actors may change their pacing, they may step on each other's lines, they may move things around, they may skip a scene entirely. So I actually prefer that live performance because it's a performance for myself as well. This is much more technical for a video or a TV show because the, the gaps and the pauses don't ever change. I get the final video, I see, I have to view it, um, I know what the kinds of things that I need to point out. Uh, for instance, if the door banging on the, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, 
in the wind next to the flower vase had I not said that it was next to the flower vase when the flower vase crashed and burned, or crashed, uh, it would be an unfamiliar or unexpected noise for the blind or low vision consumer. So I need to make sure that I, as I was talking about in my presentation, kind of preface that so when that happens, ah, the door knocked over the vase. I say that, true, to reinforce it, and then she goes over and cleans it up, but those kinds of things. You're staffing up. You have a thousand resumes. Are you looking for a fiction writer, a journalist, somebody that has an improv background? I'm looking for somebody who has audio description training. There's no one particular background that where, where audio describers excel. It could be architects, it could be writers, it could be art, uh, painters. But it's important that they get training because you can do a bad job at this kind of thing, just even in, in, with best intentions, but following the guidelines of these. These were from the Audio Description Coalition, and I have a, a list of resources and websites and URLs where I got a lot of this material uh, at the end. But uh, no, there's no one particular profile for a good audio describer. Except a great set of pipes, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's interesting you mentioned that. So I'm a writer and a voicer. I'm a voice actor, but I also write description. Now, the real craft of this and real art of it is writing the description then you can get anybody to read it. Uh, so and that's what often happens with these, these described tours. I will go to a facility, I will write this described tour, but I won't necessarily voice it. They may be subcontracted out to somebody else to read. So it depends on what the situation is. But the real skills, I think, in the writing, I just have to go out and do both. Kelly, do you have any uh, comments on, on the description itself. You're being our, our sole blind or low vision <laughs> audience member. How, how, how'd I do? Oh, you did well. Although I wondered um, sort of threat with describers, including yourself, is um, is particularly considering yourself, you know, as a voice actor and a performer, um, the description is so so uh, emotionless, it almost takes away from from the um, from the from the um, from the scene itself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because because the um, um, you know the audio describer isn't conveying the um, uh, the emotions present in, in the scene that we're experiencing. Um, you know, in the case of like a dramatic presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a balance as well, and uh, as as I mentioned, some of my my rules and guidelines of description. Scripture describers are not really supposed to be part of the performance. They're part to describe the performance that's happening, but not be another performer just in the expression. But it does happen. And when I do plays, and I tried to do that in this last scene too, where she's you know very contemplatively leaping through her her, her photo album, that and I tried to be a little bit softer in my tone and a little bit more more you know, slow in my delivery at times. But obviously, they definitely have come across to you. It didn't seem that they, it seemed it didn't seem to have a lot of empathy to yeah. to the characters. I guess that's what I was more yeah. suggesting as compared to actual conveying the emotions of the experience, right. but but sharing the empathy um, uh, that that's being created in the dramatic work. Um, obviously, yeah. that's not necessary in a in a thirty second or sixty second commercial, right. but in this longer piece, um, mm -hmm. um, music. And the characters and their um, emotions and, and how they're being portrayed, um, it would seem natural that the um, audio describer would would be coordinating with um, that sort of thing as compared to um, almost sounding like a doctor describing um, mm -hmm. um, a, a an operation or yeah. or a procedure. There's quite a bit of debate about that, and, and di different people have different uh, emotional reactions to the description. And some people do not like the describers to have any emotion at all. Other people would like a little bit more, more matching tone and matching emotion to the scene. And so, it really, depend there's, there's there's different impressions and different expectations about what that should be. I understand. Oh, and, and I 
question right now in the area of journalism, for example. Mm -hmm. Different broadcast networks have one different direction, for example. Yeah. yeah. So you, you get, you know, I've been in conferences where there uh, have been a very large number of people who are blind or have low vision, and you know, their, their impressions and their desires for description and their preferences are all over the map. So I'm not saying this is the only way to do description. This is the way I, 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 I do it. Uh, it's always a work in progress, so I appreciate the feedback. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Let's see if I can get this off the screen. Well, you've all been very patient. I appreciate that very much. And uh, I just have a couple more slides here, and I can just go down to this is cognitive dissonance. The screen is to my right. I'm not going to use the mouse a lot. I'm just going to end now. I have another slide in here where I'm going to talk about somehow audio description relates to universal design. I'd be happy to talk with anybody about that if, you, if you'd like. But I now have a slide on the screen that uh, are some resource URLs. So they're the standard.